Great. Well, thank you very much. There we go. Is everybody able to see my PowerPoint? So can you see that, Justine? Uh, yes, I can see it. So I assume everyone else can see it. <laughs> okay, super. Well, uh, uh, thank you, everybody. Um, so the purpose of this session today is to give people an introduction to uh, basic bicycle maintenance kinds of tasks uh, to help keep everybody rolling smoothly and happily <laughs> as we go through the uh, pandemic and beyond. So uh, now I spent about six years myself as a full-time everyday bike commuter and uh, I've ridden bikes not to give away too much about my age for a bit over 50 years <laughs> and so I want to try and share a little bit of my own experiences here and to help people to um, uh, make uh, their bike riding as pleasant as possible. Now here's a picture of a very typical mountain bike and just want to talk a little bit about some of the parts here. Um, now uh, as you're going to uh, ride or maintain your bike some of the more important parts that we're going to talk about today are number one the wheels and uh, the bike wheels are of course a major part of your <laughs> pleasant riding uh, experience. Uh, you can also have things happen like flat tires and so on that we'll talk about today and so how you might prevent that and also how you would potentially uh, go, about, um, uh, go about fixing that if you have problems by the side of the road. Uh, the next area of importance is your drivetrain. So you have some chain rings at the front. Uh, then you have a cassette or some sprockets at the back. And you have a chain that connects those things. And then you have some derailers or shifters at the front and uh, back. Uh, that really move the chain between sprockets and uh, those are controlled by shifters that are on your handlebars. So that's all kind of one system. I'll talk a little bit about that today, uh, particularly about how you keep your uh, uh, chain sort of in good running order. And then of course the other part that's really super important about your bike are the brakes. And uh, here's an example of a, a mountain bike with rim brakes. Uh, people now are also having a lot of bikes with disc brakes. And I'll talk a little bit about them, especially just how you make sure that they're operating safely uh, so that you have, uh, uh, they're there for you when you need them. <laughs> uh, okay, so to move on here, just uh, changing back to my pointer. Um, so, uh, and uh, I've talked about um, uh, bikes here. So there's several different kinds of bikes that people uh, would be riding. It's important to know a little bit about them just to make sure that you um, have uh, maintenance information about the correct kinds of bikes. Uh, most people or many people for commuting would ride some form of mountain bike. Uh, again, these just have, you know, kind of upright handlebars and, uh, you know, sort of medium weight and that sort of thing. Uh, people may also ride road bikes, so people that are a little bit more uh, aggressive. Uh, would have road bikes with thinner tires and drop handlebars and uh, people that commute on a fairly long-term basis uh, would probably uh, gravitate toward those just because it's a bit more efficient. Uh, you see a lot of newer riders with cruiser bikes, so very upright kind of posture and handles, uh, handlebars, that sort of thing. And then in the middle, there's a hybrid bike, uh, which again, also very common from a commuting point of view. Now, I know many of you will also have e-bikes, and while I'm not going to talk about those too specifically today, uh, the e-bikes have many things in common with traditional bikes. I'll try and mention what they are, and then also maybe make a few comments about some of the things that are a bit different. Uh, bike maintenance levels. And Justine, uh, do you still see the uh, places where I drew <laughs> the screen? <laughs> okay, so I'll try and see if I can defeat that or otherwise turn it off here so um, as I'm going through this. Uh, now uh, what I'm going to talk about today is primarily uh, from a beginner perspective so uh, safety check and one of the things we teach in our safety courses is how to make sure that your bike is safe to ride uh, before you head out. Uh, there are also a bunch of intermediate kinds of things that you may learn to do if you're a more sophisticated intrepid and a longer term rider. And these are things with the right resources that are, you know, kind of well within the abilities of uh, most people to do. And then there's a bunch of kind of more advanced things that I would say for the average person should really be left to bike shops and uh, really leave it to professionals uh, to make sure that uh, they're able to do all this stuff safely. Okay, so now, uh, 
when you go out and ride, there are things you want to take with you on every ride. And um, uh, some of the things that are important, so a multi-tool and uh, a little picture of a multi-tool uh, top left, and that has uh, uh, the ability to hopefully uh, do what most of the fasteners on your bike. And again, depending on the type of bike, uh, you need to have a multi-tool that kind of matches. Uh, the next thing down is a mini pump. So you have to have the ability to pump up your tires should one of them uh, happen to uh, lose air by the side of the road. Um, uh, the bottom uh, right, you also see uh, spare tubes. Uh, for most people, if you do get a flat tire uh, by the side of the road or while you're riding, it's far easier and faster and more reliable just to put in a new tube and then worry about trying to patch your tube when you get home. Uh, to get the bike off, bottom left, you would have tire levers with you, so to help you to get the tire off of the rim. Uh, also, bottom right, I'm showing a little tire patch kit. And uh, the patch kit uh, is in case you get more than one flat per ride. And again, uh, just depending, uh, you know, you uh, may never use it, but if you have it, then at least you know you're not going to get stranded somewhere super remote. Uh, cell phone. So if you end up with things that you can't easily fix by the side of the road or the trail, it's great to have a cell phone with you. And I guess most everybody does these days to call for help. It's also a good idea to keep bus fare with you so that if you do need to um, hop on the bus with your disabled bike to get home, uh, you have bus fare uh, handy. And then at home, there's some other stuff that you may end up using, uh, chain lubricant. And again, uh, one of the key maintenance tasks is making sure that your chain uh, stays oily and clean. So that's something you'd put on at home. And then some of the nice to have is a floor pump. So to pump up your tires at home, uh, you have a floor pump that'll have a little gauge on it saying how much air is in the tire. And again, that's something that's also super handy to have. Uh, some of you may also want to uh, buy a chain cleaning tool just to get all the grip, uh, uh, grit and grime off of your chain periodically and then also talk a little bit about this uh, as we go on here uh, chain stretch gauge so chains do wear and they do stretch and uh, when they stretch beyond a certain point you want to replace them so a lot of people uh, myself included do have a little gauge that helps them to see uh, whether or when that is in fact required now, every time before you ride, we talk about an ABC check. So the things we suggest you check from an ABC point of view, so air, you wanna try and make sure that your tires are appropriately inflated. Uh, at the very least, every time before you go riding, you should at least try to uh, push into the uh, uh, your tires with your thumbs or something like that, just to make sure that it feels very firm. Uh, if it doesn't, that's a clue that you need to go and check the air pressure. And uh, I do pump up my tires regardless once a week, uh, even if they do seem firm because um, uh, tires do lose air over time. And you know, over the course of a week, I might lose uh, 10 or 20 percent of the air in the tire. So I just want to make sure that they're fully inflated. Uh, brakes, brakes, super important. So <laughs> you want to try and make sure that your brakes are in working order and uh, check them out every time before you head out. I'll talk a little bit more about the right way to do that. And again, also keep an eye on the brake pads. Uh, what we're showing here, pads for rim brakes, but very similar concept for disc brakes. And if they get worn down too much, uh, then time to go to a, a bike shop and get them replaced. And then finally, the chain. I'll talk a little bit about the uh, chain and what it should look like if it's in good working order. And again, worth having a look at that before you head out. Uh, a couple of the other things that people do want to check out are your... Uh, uh, axles or quick releases for your wheels properly uh, tightened up before you head out. You also want to keep a bit of an eye on your cables and see if they start rusting or fraying. And then finally, if you have uh, panniers and accessories on your bike, uh, pick it up and maybe drop it from about six inches off the ground just to make sure that everything is on there firmly and that nothing falls off. So, And uh, you'd be surprised what we see when we get people to do that in safety classes. So good idea to do that once in a while as well. Now, the, the first thing in the ABCs is air, so inflating your tires. Uh, again, it's important for a number of reasons. Avoiding flat tires probably being the big one. So if your tires are fully inflated, your chances of getting a flat tire are probably, you know, four or five times less than if you're low on air. Uh, it also makes your bike much easier to pedal. And again, especially if you're commuting any kind of a distance, 
uh, important to be as efficient as you can. Uh, now to pump up your tires, I'm showing a picture here of a floor pump. That's probably the best way to do it. Uh, the floor pump has a little gauge on it so you can see how much air goes in there. Uh, if you look at the side of your tire, it'll have a little, uh, some markings on it. And I've shown an example here at the bottom. So it'll give you a range of tire pressures. And uh, we normally talk about PSI or pounds per square inch because that's what most of the pumps are uh, denominated in. Uh, if there's a range, so this one has 50 to 85, so quite a wide range, and typically you'd want to pick something in the middle, so maybe in this case 60 pounds or something like that, uh, just to make sure that you do have adequate amount of air in your tires, and again, even if it lost 10 pounds, then you're kind of still at the minimum. Uh, you'll also see at different places, so for example, Sandwich Municipal Hall has a little uh, bike kitchen, so it has a number of tools by the side of the road that you can use to uh, also potentially add air to your tires and things like that and many of those will also have a floor pump so again make sure your tires are properly inflated uh, number two your brakes so uh, checking your brakes is also very important because of course in addition to making your bike go you have to make it stop uh, before every ride it's a good idea to check your front brake uh, so your front brake will have uh, be operated by your left brake lever so it's a good idea to give it a good squeeze and then try to move your bike forward. And again, it should be possible to have the wheel be solid and then the rear wheel come off the ground a little bit as you push forward. Uh, same logic on the back brake. So that's operated by your right brake lever. And again, uh, go ahead and uh, just try to push the bike back a little bit. And again, it should uh, stay, uh, the wheel should stay locked and you should be able to get the front wheel off the ground. Uh, when your brake levers are fully depressed, uh, there should be about one inch or two and a half centimeters between the brake lever and the handlebars. And again, if it's less than that, that means probably that your cables have stretched. And uh, if you look at the picture that I'm showing here, it shows somebody uh, tightening a barrel adjuster, uh, is what that's called on the brake itself. And again, if your cables have stretched a little bit, uh, you can go and rotate that, and uh, that will take up some slack in your uh, uh, slack in your brake cables and uh, help you to keep the um, uh, brakes from getting too, uh, too mushy. Uh, one other comment in the, of course, in the safety courses is when you're stopping, uh, very important to press both of your brake levers evenly because that's kind of what maximizes the effectiveness. And um, uh, again, this is a, uh, uh, you know, something that's very important to check every day. And if you have any doubt about your brakes working properly or if there's things you can't seem to get adjusted, definitely take it to your local bike shop because having uh, your brakes are a key item from a safety point of view. Uh, chains, so I'm showing a couple of examples of chains here on the left <laughs> and the top is a good chain. A couple of the things you'll notice, one of them is it looks clean, so that's a very important um, and also it looks a little bit oily. So ideally you want your chain to be clean and a little bit oily as you're riding and uh, that's what's going to keep it working efficiently, have your uh, shifting and all that uh, continue to work smoothly. Uh, now on the bottom, kind of showing what you don't want your chain to look like. So this would be an example of a chain that's been abused for some period of time. Uh, if your chain ever gets to look like this, it's probably beyond repair, uh, but you know, hopefully you'll all be very efficient at maintaining your bikes after this and it'll never look like that. Uh, you should check your chain at least once a week just to make sure that it's uh, clean and has uh, a little bit of oil on it. Uh, after every few rides, you want to clean your chain. Uh, an easy way to do that is just to sp uh, spray it with a little bit of oil or WD-40 and to use a disposable towel like the blue shop towels that are available in um, uh, most home improvement stores. Uh, and then you want to oil it lightly. And in the uh, top picture there, it shows somebody oiling their chain and uh, you wanna get some good bike lubricant that's suitable for your conditions. And then you really de do need to go and put it on link by link. So one little drop on each link and uh, rotate the chain around as you're uh, going to do that. And then when you've got every link oiled a little bit, then you wanna rotate your chain and use a, um, a disposable blue cloth to uh, wipe off any excess oil. Uh, if you do end up using a rag, it's just important to remember uh, that when your oil uh, rags get oily and dirty, uh, you have to just basically throw them away and you can't put them in a washing machine or else it creates a bit of a safety hazard.
the other thing about chains is that they do stretch over time. So the little links wear and the chain uh, over time gets longer. <laughs> and if it does that, uh, then it can uh, cause damage to both the chain rings and to the cassette. And instead of having to replace a chain for you know, 30 or $40, you might have to replace chain rings and uh, cassette for a couple of hundred dollars. So a good idea to check that periodically. Uh, if you get a tool, which is quite inexpensive, you can do it yourself or any bike shop will do that for you very quickly as part of routine maintenance. Uh, roadside flat repair. So one of the most common problems that people will have, even if their tires are inflated properly, is every once in a while they will get a flat tire. Uh, again, the things you need to have with you, so you need to have a little pump, you need to have some tire levers to get the tire off the rim itself, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. And then you need to have an appropriate tube with you uh, to put on uh, to get you going again. And again, it's also a good idea to have a, a patch kit with you uh, just in case you do end up getting uh, more than one flat tire in a ride. So, you know, something that won't happen that often, but uh, you do want to try and be ready for that. Now, there are many different kinds of spare tubes, and it's important to make sure that the tube you carry with you actually does match your bike. Uh, the tubes have different kinds of valves on them. So uh, top left is something called a Schrader valve. That would also be similar to what you'd have on a car or motorcycle tire. Uh, the one on the uh, in the middle of the picture there is what's called a Presta valve, and that's becoming more common. Uh, Presta valves are mechanically a little bit better because by default, even if the uh, something gets loose, they keep the air in and they have to sort of be depressed to let the air out whereas the uh, Schrader valves are kind of the opposite. Uh, but whatever kind your bike has, it's important to make sure that your spare tire matches and again, your pump can inflate it. Now to uh, pack them, some of them come sort of pre-wrapped in plastic to uh, keep them in a nice little bundle uh, to carry with you. Uh, and if they uh, happen to not be like that, then you can use your sort of plastic cling wrap or saran wrap kind of stuff uh, to wrap it all tightly. Now, to carry your tools with you, uh, one of the things I probably should have mentioned, there's several different ways you can do it. If you commute, uh, commute with panniers, uh, the best thing to do is just to put your tools and tubes and all that stuff at the bottom of your pannier. And then that way, when you take it on and off your bike, you'll have it with you. Uh, some people also will use a little seat bag. So again, you can get a, uh, something about the size of, um, you know, a little grapefruit or something like that that attaches underneath your seat and uh, holds the essential stuff. Or you can also get something that looks like a water bottle and you can put your tools and your tube and so forth inside that. And again, when you lock up your bike at your destination, uh, then you can pull that off and just uh, take that with you. Now, how to fix a flat tire. Uh, I won't go into it in huge detail, but this will be part of the resources that we'll put on the website after the, um, after the webinar here. Uh, step number one, flat tire kit. So I've talked a little bit about how to do that. Uh, remove your wheel. Uh, again, if you do happen to have a quick release, you can get it off pretty quickly. If you have wheels that are fastened on in some other fashion and uh, bolts are sometimes, nuts and bolts are good to have from a, an anti-theft point of view. Uh, also, some of the um, uh, bikes now do have through axles and other things, so whatever tool you need to get it off is something you have to carry with you. Uh, let any remaining air out of your tube, and again, um, uh, just to make sure that it's easier to get the tire off. Uh, then to get the tire off itself, uh, number five, uh, you start by putting in a tire lever and starting to work the tire off the rim itself. And then depending on how tight the fit is, you may need to use uh, two or three tire levers uh, to get the uh, a tire to the point where you can take it off by hand. Uh, when you've got enough of a gap, you can pull the tube out from underneath the tire and just pull it all the way around. Uh, when it comes to put the new tube back in, uh, again, you uh, pump it up a little bit uh, to try to get um, get it looking a little bit like the tire that you the tube that you've just taken off. Uh, you stuff that in very carefully. So number 15, you push the tube uh, back um, uh, into the tire itself and get the valve through the uh, uh, appropriate opening. And then to number 16 is a really critical point to put your tire back on. You always want to do that by hand 
and don't use your tire levers because if you use your tire levers to do it, it's very easy to puncture it again. And um, uh, then finally, uh, rotate your tire to make sure that there's no tube sticking out because again, if you didn't quite get it all stuffed in there and you go and inflate your tire, uh, then it can uh, cause another puncture. And again, try to inflate it as best you can by the side of the road. If you have a road bike or something, chances are your mini pump won't quite get you to the recommended pressure, uh, but it needs to get you to a pressure where you can uh, uh, safely ride away. So those are kind of the highlights. Again, this will be uh, as part of the materials from the webinar and a very good idea to practice this ahead of time and to try to do this at home uh, so that when you go to do it along the trail, uh, you know how to do it and you're sure that you have the proper tools with you. Uh, roadside breakdowns, you are going to have various kinds of problems that are going to happen while you're riding. Uh, a lot of the more minor problems, again, if you have those tools with you, you can repair them yourself. Uh, if you have something happen that's a bit more major, uh, sometimes uh, fellow riders will be able to help you out a little bit. So uh, you need to consider safety in these days, uh, distancing, but most uh, people who ride bikes are pretty helpful. Uh, if your bike can't easily be fixed, call for help. So if you have your cell phone with you, uh, you can call friends or family to hopefully come and give you a ride uh, or to bring out tools that they need to kind of complete the repairs. Um, you can also get on the bus. So all of the buses in the greater Victoria area do have bike racks on them. A good idea to watch a video or watch other people so you know how to get your bike on and off. And again, that's part of the reason why you keep a spare bus fare with you as a part of your repair kit. Also, if you happen to have a membership in the BC Automobile Association, uh, they do offer an assist for people who ride bikes as well. And again, you can just call them and they will come out and bring things to either help you repair a problem on your bike or else uh, uh, they will uh, take you to uh, your home or a repair shop. Now, local bike shops. So we all have to do our part <laughs> to keep our bikes operating uh, safely and efficiently. And in many cases, you'll have things happen that you can't easily fix yourself. So very important to uh, get to know your local bike shop. And again, if we uh, give them enough uh, business, then they will be there for us when we need them. Uh, now, it's a good idea to take your bike to a bike shop for periodic tune-up. And I'm kind of suggesting here once or twice a year or every couple thousand kilometers, just uh, depending on how much you ride your bike or if it starts to uh, uh, starts to give you uh, problems or starts to be uh, rough and shifting and things like that, then good idea to drop by. Um, if you have a lot of trouble shifting gears, again, that's something if you ride more, you can figure out how to do some of those adjustments yourself. Or if you don't, your local bike shop, always happy to help with that. Uh, frayed cables. So sometimes you'll see your bike cables start to get rusty or the ends of them will start to get frayed. And again, uh, bike shops are best to do those kinds of replacements. If you feel uh, kind of you know binding or anything like that while you're riding, again, uh, to the extent that you need help diagnosing that, uh, bike shops are great. And particularly if you ever have anything happen to your bike that you think affects the safety, great idea to take it to a bike shop before you ride it and uh, make sure that you don't end up with a crash because of some sort of a maintenance problem. Now our resources. So, there is an amazing amount of resources available regarding bike maintenance and um, some of the uh, very useful resources. So uh, the Bike to Work Society is putting together a resource library that will include this webinar and the replay, as well as uh, replays of many of the other webinars that are going to be uh, presented over the next uh, a couple of months here. Uh, an invaluable resource from a uh, repair point of view or maintenance point of view is YouTube. There is nothing that can be done to a bike that is not covered by dozens of <laughs> videos on YouTube. And I really encourage that because it's much, much easier to watch a video than it is to try and read a book. Uh, some of the websites that are good, the parktool.com, uh, just a great website. Almost every maintenance procedure known to mankind is presented uh, in a way there that is very easy. Uh, they'll link to um, uh, videos on their YouTube channel. So that's always a great starting point when I need to fix something that is uh, new for me. Uh, there are also some other good websites. One of the classics was something called sheldonbrown.com. And although Sheldon passed away a couple of years ago, people continue to maintain the website. 
and it was a, a great resource. Uh, also, here are uh, email addresses for myself and Justine. So if you do have follow-on questions, uh, please feel free to email them to us. And then also a bit of a promotion here. Our next webinar is going to be May 28th, 11 a.m. Our uh, head instructor, Lana Taves, is going to talk about the Motor Vehicle Act and help you to kind of understand your rights and obligations as you ride your bike. And um, as we get more people riding bikes, uh, very important that people try to follow the rules of the road and uh, make sure that they uh, uh, act in a way that is safe and respectful. So if you don't quite know what your rights and obligations are, that's a great way to get up to speed on that. So with that, I will pause there and um, uh, then uh, Justine will help to see if uh, there are any questions I can answer and I'll just uh, stop the slides here. Thanks so here. much, Tom. Yeah. Oh, super. I'll just uh, change presenter. Great. There we go. All right. So it should switch back over to you now, Justine, and uh, we can get into some Q&A. Fabulous. Okay. So just a reminder to folks, the question box on the right side of your screen. Um, doesn't look like I have too many yet. So get your questions in there and we can answer them live here. I have one emailed in um, and Todd, wonder if you can help with this. Uh, can we address how disc brakes between, in between, sorry, can we, can we address how to clean disc brakes in between bike shop appointments? My 15 year old has a dirty bike and a three week wait for a tune up appointment at a bike shop. I've washed the bike, but the brakes still seem to be dirty slash sticky. And I didn't know what could be done in the meantime. Uh, sure, so uh, where it comes to disc brake related problems, I would definitely refer to parktool.com as a way to uh, figure out the uh, best and most efficient way to do that. Uh, generally speaking, cleaning the discs and the calipers isn't that fussy, but the most critical thing in cleaning any kind of brakes is to not let them get oily. And again, if you're lubricating your bike or you know using any sort of a lubricant, you have to keep it well away from your brakes and braking surfaces. And if you do end up getting oil onto your braking surfaces or brake pads, uh, then you do need to get to um, a bike shop so that they can degrease them and you'll probably have to replace your uh, brake pads. Uh, but again, as long as you stay away from that, uh, generally speaking, they are not that hard to clean and uh, Park Tool has some good suggestions on how to do that. Thanks. Hopefully um, the person who emailed that in is here or I could just send them an email back. Um, question from Carolyn. Uh, Todd, do you have any chain lube recommendations? Uh, well, I would go to your local bike shop, but the uh, one that I've used over the years that worked well for me was something called TriFlow. Uh, but that being said, there are many different kinds that seem to work well. And, you know, again, I would go and have a, a quick chat with your local bike shop. In Victoria, we tend to have more wet weather than dry weather. So most people would tend to use some sort of a wet weather loop pretty much all year round. Okay. And dry tri flow is wet weather loop. Yeah, it's pretty much a pretty much a wet weather loop, and again, use it all year round. And it does seem to strike kind of the right balance uh, between being too thick and too thin. <laughs> so it goes on in a good consistency. It doesn't drip and it doesn't uh, pick up too much dust either. So. Okay. Um, we have a question from Demi. Uh, what does binding while pedaling mean? And I think you mentioned this um, when you were recommending to go to a bike shop. Uh, yeah, what I mean by that, particularly if you um, have your brakes rubbing or things of that nature, uh, you know, you can try to loosen your brake cables a little bit with the barrel adjuster and, you know, try and back them off a bit if they're too tight. Um, but if you have problems where you have like the brake sticking or something like that, uh, or if you go and spin your wheels and you see, uh, if you're looking from above, you see the wheel wobbling from side to side, uh, that means that your wheel is out of true and that uh, you need to have uh, uh, the wheel trued or have the spokes adjusted 
And that's something for most people, definitely better left to a bike shop. So binding is when they're, it's just not pedaling well, there's kind of like a crunching noise? Uh, yeah, it can be uh, crunching or you could just have it not, um, you know, not uh, the wheels not turning smoothly. And again, more often than not, because one of the brakes is uh, uh, rubbing against the tire. And again, if you can uh, easily adjust it to free that up, then terrific. Uh, but if not, that's one time you may want to uh, uh, drop by a bike shop. All right. Thank you. Um, question from Adam. Is WD-40 a good lube for my chain? That is a great question. No, it is not. <laughs> WD-40 is a solvent, not a lubricant. Uh, so it's a good thing to use when you're trying to clean your chain. Uh, but it will basically dissolve any of the oil that is on your chain. And so once you wipe the WD-40 off, important to put some oil back on because uh, WD-40 really doesn't provide uh, a much lubricating value. Okay. Um, oh, yeah. Here, oh, on that same note from Lana, I've heard that solvents in WD-40 can turn to varnish over time. Better to spray the chain clean with water, let dry, then lubricant, lubricate the next day. Um, water versus WD-40, Todd? Uh, well, myself, mostly I use water. So when I'm finished riding my bike, if it gets all dirty, I'll generally spray it off with a hose. I'll uh, use a cloth or something to wipe the water off the chain, and then I'll lubricate it right away to make sure that the chain doesn't rust. Uh, the suggestion for WD-40 was from one of our other instructors, uh, John Holland. And again, you just have to kind of figure out what works for you. And uh, there's people that have many different recipes, but the important thing is just to try and clean it on a, a fairly frequent basis. Um, question from Megan. Do I need to clean the gunk off my chain ring? <laughs> Yeah, when you're cleaning your bike periodically, you definitely need to try and uh, get the gunk off of anywhere that it accumulates. So, you know, if you're riding in bad conditions or, you know, you're riding on uh, uh, the lockside trail and it's dusty, you know, you will end up getting some combination of oil and dust on your uh, drivetrain. And again, as you go to clean it off, good idea to clean all that stuff too, because otherwise it will tend to wear your chain. Uh, sometimes when I have that, I'll just use you know, a dry cloth, and I'll just use the dry cloth to um, uh, to uh, rotate the chain rings and just sort of wipe that off as I go around. Or that's something that if you uh, get into a little bit more heavy-duty bike maintenance, uh, some people would also use a degreaser as something to get some of that kind of stuff off. Mm -hmm. um, is it possible to put too much air in my tires? How do I know? <laughs> Well, that's part of the reason why it's good to have a floor pump, because a floor pump will have a gauge on it so that you can see how much air is in there. Uh, you know, so if you read the sidewalls, it'll give you a range. So in my example, it said, you know, 50 to 85 PSI. I definitely try to go somewhere in the midpoint of that range. And again, if you're a lighter rider, you tend to go towards the bottom of that range. If you're a larger rider, you tend to go closer to the top of that range. I would never inflate my tires beyond the top of that range. And, uh, uh, and unless you have a really, really good floor pump, it's actually very hard to overinflate a tire anyway. But if you stay within that range, that's definitely what gives you the best results. Um, Archie asks, uh, do you think that a CO2 cartridge would be a good alternative to a pump? You know, that is a great question. My children are racers, and so as they've been out riding in many cases, they'll take a CO2 cartridge with them. Uh, the bad news about CO2 cartridges is they are very unforgiving. <laughs> so if you, uh, you know, happen to try to, for example, thread it onto your valve and you don't have it on quite correctly, and then you, uh, you know, turn on the CO2, uh, then the problem is then it leaks out <laughs> and you don't have anything left to inflate your tire with. So if you are going to use CO2 cartridges, I would take one in a spare. Um, you know, but in most cases, I think people are better off with a little uh, mini pump. Um, for the CO2 cartridge, uh, is that special to any bike? 
or it, it just works there it's the same no they're they're very uh, generic but you do need an inflator that attaches to the co2 cartridge and again that has to have the correct fitting to attach to the uh, valve on your tire uh, the other drawback by the way of the co2 cartridges that i will mention is that they do produce uh, metal waste uh, whereas a mini pump doesn't produce anything that needs to be recycled, so it is a bit more environmentally friendly. Awesome. Um, Sarah asks, are there any chain cleaner machines necessary or worth the money? Uh, well, definitely, if you're keen on keeping your chain clean, there are many good cleaners. Uh, uh, the one that I have in my garage is from Park Tool. And again, it's uh, not too much of a hassle to use. Uh, it uses a, a non-petroleum-based solvent, uh, basically like dish soap. And, um, you know, so you can clean your chain very well with that. It's a little bit of extra work. Uh, but if you're very keen, definitely worthwhile. And, uh, you know, especially if you ride frequently in very dirty conditions, a uh, good idea to uh, do that periodically as well. Um. Adrian asks, any tips for keeping your chain in good condition when commuting every day over the winter months? Uh, should I hose my bike down every day to remove the dirt buildup and then clean the chain once a week? So this is specifically about uh, like winter riding. Oh, absolutely. And uh, I commuted, uh, <laughs> I commuted rain or shine uh, every day for six years on the uh, Lockside Trail. Uh, what I would do is I would spray my bike off at least a few times a week to get the uh, gunk off. But again, anytime you do spray off your chain with water, uh, very important to oil it again right after that because otherwise your chain will rust and it'll uh, start to look like <laughs> the bottom uh, bottom picture in my slide there. So, okay. Um, I have a question here. It's a long one. Let me see. Um, from my understanding, fixing a flat tube using patches should only be done in emergency cases only. In the case we can't find a new tube within reasonable time, would a tube fixed with patches still last long enough to be a reliable and safe option? Uh, I think the short answer is if it's patched properly, the answer is yes. And um, uh, again, I've had tubes that I've patched that have lasted for years. <laughs> You know, and, and that won't necessarily be the case every time. If there's a lot of damage to the tube and you uh, are able to patch it enough to ride on it, uh, then you kind of have to make the judgment call of whether you trust that to kind of keep going on it. Uh, and again, uh, when it comes to figuring out how to uh, patch tubes, again, that definitely is something I would practice at home. Uh, depending on the nature of the uh, puncture, it isn't always that easy to get it done properly. Uh, and again, it is kind of a uh, a last resort when you're uh, uh, kind of go beyond one flat in a ride. Mm -hmm. um, Todd, this question is about your shirt. Where did you get it? <laughs> I got it at a little store in Sydney called DG Bremner, and uh, I'm sure that they would look forward to your, uh, as a small local merchant, I'm sure they would look forward to your business. <laughs> um, can you recommend a bike shop for servicing a lefty mountain bike? I've wasted hundreds of dollars on bad service. This is from Adrian. Uh, well, that, yeah, I mean, that is a good question. I mean, generally speaking, the bike shop where you bought the bike is generally a good starting point. Uh, mm -hmm. But that having been said, if you don't get a satisfactory result, then I would go to um, a couple other bike shops. And again, I would, uh, Maybe just try talking to the mechanics and see what kind of a, a comfort level you get. And uh, uh, again, I don't want to <laughs> recommend any particular bike shop, but there are a number out there with very good, highly experienced mechanics. Uh, this one is from us. Um, I have a bike that had to stay outside for the winter and is in fairly bad shape. What would you suggest for me cleaning it up? There is some rust. Uh, well, again, uh, depending on what it is that's rusted and how badly it's rusted, a good starting point would be to replace the chain. And again, uh, most bike shops can replace a chain fairly cost effectively, or else there are stores out there like MEC where you can go and buy a chain. 
And, uh, you know, certainly for anybody at the kind of intermediate level, uh, replacing a chain with the correct tool is something you could easily do yourself, but I would start with replacing the chain. Um, I guess I also just wanted to plug here, um, on our website, uh, bike to work victoriaca we've put together a list of bike shops that are still open um, with like these COVID-19 times. So if you were wondering where to kind of start with your, your bike maintenance issues, then our website's a good place to stop. Um, yeah, and, and uh, bike shops are deemed an essential service, so most of them have actually been open even through the uh, even through the lockdown. So uh, this one's from Alex. Say a bicycle rode smoothly on lower gears and then began to bind slash grind when switched to the higher gears. Uh, what could be an explanation for this? Uh, well, it sounds like you'd have a problem with your derailleur adjustment. And again, that's something that if you're fairly confident in uh, adjusting your bike, you can go to parktool.com and look up the sections on adjusting your front and rear derailleurs. Uh, again, if there's kind of a slight misadjustment at one end of the spectrum, uh, then it kind of tends to get amplified as you shift up the cassette, for example. And uh, so I would look at that procedure for your uh, rear derailleur on parktool.com might be a good starting point. Um, if I don't have an indoor space to store my bike, so I have to keep it outdoors, can this do damage to my bike? Is there anything I can do to protect it or things to look out for? Uh, well, I guess the short answer is that it is not ideal to have to store your bike outside. Uh, you know, a couple of reasons. I mean, one of them is it makes it easier to steal and definitely you want to uh, try and keep your bike secure. Uh, but if you do have to keep it outside, then I would just find a, uh, a sheet of heavy plastic or a tarp or something like that and I would just cover it up as you uh, come home and keep the water off it. And again, if you can keep it dry, uh, then generally speaking, that'll uh, help to reduce the damage quite a bit. Um, is there any anything to look out for damage-wise if you're keeping your bike outdoors, just like rust? Yeah, again, I would just especially really try to look at the uh, uh, keeping your chain nice and clean and well oiled because that'll really help to keep the rest of the drivetrain from getting damaged and again anything you can do to cover your bike and keep it out of the rain uh, definitely will uh, will help a lot because as the old song said uh, rust never sleeps <laughs> um, here's a question for Megan uh, does the chain ring also need to be uh, lubricated along with the chain after it's cleaned off. Uh, she said her video dropped out, um, so she's sorry if this was addressed, but I think I think you did mention about the chain chain ring. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a great question. So generally speaking, if you put uh, lubricant on the chain, then generally speaking, there's enough of it that will transfer on to the chain rings and the cassette to keep those uh, operating smoothly. Uh, you may want to uh, lubricate the uh, little wheels on the derailleur periodically because uh, again that's something that can require a little bit of uh, a little bit of lubrication to keep it running smoothly although most of the newer derailleurs do run on sealed bearings but if you keep the chain well lubricated generally speaking that's good enough to keep the rest of the drivetrain going um... Uh, I have a question that says, my disc brakes squeak a lot. Is this a bad thing? Uh, does it mean that I need to get new brake pads? Uh, well, that's a good question. It depends what the riding conditions are like. So if you're riding in dry weather, it is very common for brakes to squeak because you will get a little bit of dust onto the uh, braking surfaces in the brake pads. And so when you go and apply the brakes, you will get a bit of squeaking. Uh, but the bottom line is, do the brakes work effectively? So if the brakes are working effectively, a little bit of squeaking or squealing isn't necessarily the end of the world. Uh, but if your brakes stop working effectively so they don't stop the bike as quickly as they used to, uh, then you know if you feel good doing it yourself, I'd replace the brake pads. Or if you don't, I'd go to a bike shop. 
A question from Melissa. I have an older bike that I've just started using again after not riding for a while. The chain falls off when I ride it. What can I do to fix this? Uh, the chain falling off again generally would be a problem with the way your derailleurs are adjusted. And again, uh, you know, any of the bicycle maintenance websites like Park Tool would have good instructions on how to adjust a derailleur, or you could just take it into a bike shop. Uh, but the derailleurs have something called a limit screw. And again, if the limit screws aren't adjusted properly, it will be very, uh, uh, your chain will tend to fall off. Hmm. Is that also an issue with um, the chain stretching? Uh, well, the chain stretching uh, doesn't necessarily cause it to fall off more frequently, although I guess anything is possible. Uh, but the concern with chain stretch is after a while, it will start to wear off the teeth on the, um, uh, the chain rings and the cassette. And again, mm -hmm. if you let it go long enough and it starts to round off those teeth, uh, then even with a new chain, your drivetrain won't work smoothly anymore. So that's mm -hmm. why you want to kind of, uh, be very um, uh, very diligent in looking for chain stretch and gain much cheaper to replace a chain than it is to have to replace things like chain rings or cassettes. Mm -hmm. um, another question about chains. Um, do you have any tips on putting a chain back on uh, when it falls off when you're riding? Uh, well, one of the things I will tend to, you know, you can carry in your, um, uh, can carry your little repair kit as you could either carry some disposable gloves or you could carry a you know one or two of those disposable cloths and again uh, you know generally speaking not that hard to kind of thread your chain back on but the downside most times is you end up being covered in grease <laughs> so if you either have you know a nitrile glove or a little disposable cloth you can keep the grease off of your hands and make it a little bit easier to put the chain back on and again, if the chain does fall off frequently, then I would try and uh, get the drivetrain adjusted. Okay. Um, if my chain is a little, oh, no, sorry, if my wheel is a little wobbly, should I be worried about it? Um, and how do I check if my wheels wobble? <laughs> well, that's a good question. So uh, what you can do is just lift your bike off the ground, kind of stand above it and give the wheels a bit of a spin. And again, as you're looking down from the top, if you see it sort of moving back and forth, uh, then chances are that it is a little bit out of true. And again, if it's out of true, like, uh, you know, one or two millimeters, but your brakes still work effectively, then that's okay. But if it's out of true more than that, and your brakes start to, um, you know, start to uh, bind or something like that, uh, or don't work as effectively, then you definitely want to get that addressed. And again, it's the same kind of thing that if you get the wheel trued when it's slightly out of true, uh, then they can do that very effectively, but beyond some point being out of true damages the rim and you end up having to replace the uh, rim or the wheel. So I wouldn't let it go too long if you see that. Okay. Um, Ricardo says, I have been told that chain lubricant for rainy weather condition also works well for dry weather conditions. Is this true? Yeah, again, in Victoria, we probably tend to get more wet weather than dry weather. The, um, uh, the only consideration is that a lot of the wet lubes uh, do have, you know, are a bit thicker and a bit stickier. So if you are riding in really dusty weather, they can tend to pick up more dust. Uh, so that's why I tended to use something like TriFlow that was a bit of a middle of the road kind of lubricant. Uh, but if you do use a wet lube during the summer, for example, then I would just uh, watch and make sure you don't get too much dust building up, uh, you know, uh, too much gunk building up in your chain because your oil is attracting dust. Uh, great. This one is sort of specific, Todd. Um, Carolyn says, I have a ta Townie 7D, so only a rear derailleur, but I have chronic issues shifting up from one, from one to two, even with new chains. Any ideas why or how to prevent? Uh, well, a couple of a uh, couple of thoughts are, I mean, that, you know, that would be, I would try to adjust the derailleur. And again, um, you know, if you have a, a competent mechanic, try to adjust it, then that would be a good starting point. 
But if you do have ongoing problems, even with the derailleur being correctly adjusted, uh, then I would try to look at the alignment of the derailleur itself and make sure that the derailleur cage isn't uh, bent or there's a little piece that attaches the derailleur to the frame called a, a derailleur hanger. And again, if you drop your bike or if you're in some kind of a minor collision, uh, the derailleur hangers often get bent. And again, they can cause some misalignment that leads to bad shifting. And if that is the case, the derailleur hangers are you know, a $20 item and are, are relatively easy to replace. So I would definitely have a look at that alignment. So that is all the questions I've gotten so far. Um, and we're pretty much at the one hour point. Um, so folks, if there are more questions that you have, please feel free to email me, my, myself or uh, Todd. Um, in a follow-up email that's coming, there, both of our emails will be available. Uh, I also encourage everyone, uh, once they're done the webinar, to take a very short survey. Uh, it just helps us keep these going, keep everything free, um, and make sure that uh, we're doing a good job and we're, we're satisfying everybody's desires when they come to webinars. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for coming today. Thank you, Todd, for your great presentation and all your really great answers. Um, and uh, like like Todd said, we have another webinar coming up next Thursday um, and lots of resources online, uh, all available for free. So thank you very much. Thanks. Have a great day and smooth riding, everyone. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.